let's have a chat about Pokemon, the Nintendo Switch, rumors, and fan speculation. Hello again, I am Blunty, and the rumor and speculation scene around Pokemon is on the boil right now. In this video, first, I want to frame up how the rumor mill works for Pokemon games, then I'm going to get into my own hopes and expectations and guesses based on the current state of the rumors. So, it's this time of year, as it has been for 20 odd years of Pokemon games, that Pokemon fandom starts hitting the throttle on the hype train. Wait, do trains have throttles? I guess the electric ones do. These are ones too, probably. But, you know, I'm picturing a steam train because it's more romantic. But anyway, <laughs> sidelined already. Only these days, uh, the, the, the rumors and stuff spread even faster than it used to because of the way social media works these days. Back in the day, it was just, you know, buried little forums here and there on little sites. And even back, back, back in the day, friggin' magazines on newsstands. <laughs> But I've been a Pokemon player since Generation 1 was the hot new fresh tank, and I've been through this over and over and over again. And there's some pretty clear patterns that settle in, and you must manage, you must manage your own expectations versus these alleged leaks and rumors and speculations. If you let yourself latch too heavily onto an idea and the truth winds up being anything else, you'll feel let down, perhaps even angry. Far more let down and angry than you would have felt if you just take control of your own mind and not let yourself run away and get obsessed with an idea that may not even be true. Now, over the years, there's been many completely bullplop rumors around Pokemon and supposed new games. Once upon a time, the community was sure, without a shadow of a doubt, that a game called Pokemon Z was coming out, and it was going to be a third-tier game for X and Y, and it was going to complete the story of Zygarde, and, uh, um, yeah, it never happened. Before that, the community was sure that Pokemon Grey was on its way to follow Black and White as a third-tier game. Then there was the often forgotten rumors about an alleged Pokemon Rainbow game that would have, supposedly, collected the maps and Pokemon from what was then all four generations of game into one huge, wonderful mega game. Man, what an enticing rumor that one was. Then, of course, as a more recent example, there was the claim, back when the Nintendo Switch was unreleased and still known only as the NX, the community was buzzing loudly with strong beliefs that Pokemon Sun and Pokemon Moon were going to be getting upgraded ports to this new mysterious powerful console as well as their expected home on 3DS. And of course, last year's many, many rumors about a supposed Pokemon Stars game, a third tier game to follow the current 3DS titles of Moon and Sun, but it too would be on the Nintendo Switch. <gasps> This one even had what many considered to be quote-unquote very reliable sources. Of course, not a single one of these games ever surfaced in any meaningful way as anything more than hearsay, rumor, and wild speculation and guesswork. Some of them may have in fact been true. It's fair to say, in game development and planning, sometimes plans change. Games get cancelled or reimagined or rebuilt from the ground up in the process of creation. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, for example, we all know it is an absolute smash hit launch title for the Nintendo Switch, and in fact it is still regarded as one of the best games for the Nintendo Switch, if not one of the best games of its type ever on any platform. It's widely known it was bought into the world intended to be a Nintendo Wii U title, and only late in its development was it even ported for the Switch. So there may well have been plans, perhaps even some amount of genuine development for games like Z, Grey, Rainbow, and Stars. Point is, though, is when these did not come to pass, a lot of the community was frustrated, disappointed, annoyed, even lashing out at other people in the community or Game Freak and Nintendo themselves. Those angry idiots blaming other people for their own willingness to let themselves get way too attached to an idea. A rumor, a piece of speculation. Remember how the community reacted when Pokemon Stars suddenly vanished from our minds and we were instead met with a pretty lightly modified re-release of last year's game? Sun and Moon got slapped with Ultra in their titles, the story was very slightly tweaked, and that's about it. 
Instead of a shiny new Nintendo Switch Pokemon game, we got something with less substantive changes than a community-made ROM hack. And the community was angry. Angrier than they would have been had they not let themselves latch onto the hopes and dreams of the imagined Pokemon Stars game. And even when new game rumours are legitimate, there is a ton of crap mixed in with the truth. We always get supposed rumours and leaks about what turns out to be fake starters, fake legendaries, fake evolutions and the like. Now, real information about any new Pokemon game comes out at a pretty predictable pace and in a pretty predictable order. It always has done. We're a bit later in the cycle this year than we usually are. Often the level of rumour we have right now is achieved by mid-March, for example. But here's how it breaks down for basically every single new generation and game we've ever had, at least in the main series. Though we'll say again, we're a bit behind schedule this year, so that may mean a more compressed schedule of this routine. And perhaps even skipping a few steps because of logical reasons with the cast of the game and the setting of the game as rumoured. But all that said, this is where we are right now for the new Nintendo Switch games, which we already know we are in fact being made, of course. This was confirmed by Game Freak themselves last year. They said, yes, we're making a new Pokemon game. It's going to be the main series thing. It's going to be on the Nintendo Switch. We know all this already, so we know they're coming. So the order of genuine leaks and reveals pretty much always goes like this. First, the new names of the games leak. That just happened, with the leaks suggesting that Pokemon Let's Go are the new titles. Next, we'll likely see some silhouettes of the new supposed starters, probably from Cora Cora magazine as usual. Although, with these games, that may not happen as Scuttlebutt is, it's a reboot back in Kanto. So perhaps no new Pokemon for starters at all. We may still get different starters from the existing cast. Then we'll get an official announcement confirming the names of the games, usually along with some kind of teaser trailer, which of course the community will pick apart frame by frame and speculate on every last individual pixel and detail. <laughs> then we'll get a proper start to reveal. At E3 we might even get a trailer or even some gameplay, but although this has happened, historically it's far less common for it to happen. After that, We'll get more information and a proper reveal of the setting and the world and the map and such. Then we'll get some new Pokemon reveals. Probably. In this case, if we're back in Kanto, maybe some new evolutions for existing Pokemon. Then, if there's new starters, we'll get leaks and reveals of their evolutions. Then, perhaps some generalized talk from Game Freak about new mechanics or features in the games. And finally, the trailer. And then the whole machine changes gear from drip feeding out hype fuel to full on marketing push as launch day approaches. In between all of that predictable marketing machine leaking out and properly releasing information, there's all of the random fandom speculation, all these attempts to join the dots, the navigation of fakes, maybe even if we get a demo before release, like we have for the last few years, some clever buggers will do the data mining thing and it will reveal some more juicy details. But yeah, it's a pretty predictable process and a pretty predictable pace and something that has very, very rarely been deviated from over the last two decades of Pokemon games. Now, as to my own hopes and reactions to the rumours, and I'm going to go on here with the expectation that you're pretty familiar with the current state of rumours as I won't be re-explaining them in full detail here. I'm just going to talk about what I hope is going to happen or what I think is not going to happen. The names. I'm okay with them. Let's go Pikachu and let's go Eevee have a nice catchy ring to them. There's an excitable energy to the names I find appealing. And of course, the mascots for both games are both very, very popular and very, very cute and very, very marketable as merchandise. <laughs> I don't think having the word go in the names means at all that it will be tied to the mobile game Pokemon Go. Though I do think it'll be made use of in marketing as the name recognition of one will lead naturally into further exposure of the other. I absolutely do not think two entirely separate developers working on two entirely different games on entirely different hardware systems and two entirely different distribution networks and storefronts would even want to tie themselves and their development cycles to each other in any meaningful way, if at all. Logistically alone, it sounds like a friggin' nightmare. I do agree with the conjecture that the names of the games may indeed indicate not your own starter Pokemon, 
but those of your main rival, as it is a bit misbalanced otherwise. Starter Pokemon have always had that rock, paper, scissors kind of dynamic, and Pikachu and Eevee do not have that. Eevee has multiple evolution paths and typings, Pikachu does not. Perhaps, if people guessing that it's a kind of reboot or reimagining of Pokemon Yellow are right, we do get these as starters, only they're evolution locked like Pikachu in Pokemon Yellow was. Although that too would be unbalanced as Eevee isn't nearly as effective as Pikachu is before the evolutions. I do hope though at some point in both games we get a chance to have an Eevee on our team because it is one of my personal favourites. Umbrian, if you're curious about my favourite evolution, by the way. <laughs> I would like to see, at last though, a freshening up of the standard fire, water, grass starters. I mean, sure, we got some dual typings in later games, firefighting and stuff like that, but with so many types and so many type combinations we have these days, it seems silly to be so restricted with the starters. I'm expecting a customizable player character, as we've had in the most recent games, although this time I'd like to see a more full system. Not just clothing and hairstyle and eye colour, but a complete custom character system. Facial features, height, weight, the whole thing, you know how it goes. And although I very much doubt it will happen because Nintendo would live in fear of the inevitable sad outcry of the Stone Agers who refuse to recognize the world they are surrounded by these days, perhaps even completely unrestricting previously gendered clothing and accessories. So regardless of if you pick a boy or a girl, you could dress up however you bloody well like. I did see a couple of days ago a pretty unsubstantiated rumour from someone who claimed to be on the team doing the Chinese translation for the games that the game is indeed set in Kanto, but hundreds of years after we last saw it in a game, and there's been significant environmental change since then. Pallet Town, for example, is now completely submerged underwater. It's in ruins, abandoned. Now, I like this rumour, as it suggests a have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too kind of deal. We get all the nostalgia of returning to Kanto once more, but it would also still give us a significantly different world map and environments to explore, which itself may lead to more interesting things like a Alolan form Pokemon, where Gen 1 Pokemon have adapted and changed to suit their new environment on the Alolan Islands. Similarly, perhaps a dramatic change in Kanto's environment, topology and climate would lead to Pokemon we already know and love having been changed in form and typings. This too is a have your cake and eat it too option. I know I fell in love with a lowland form Vulpix the instant I saw one. Sand slash too for that matter. I don't think we're going to get the truly open world Pokemon game we've all been aching for for years upon years. I suspect it'll be a more traditionally pathed RPG experience. But I do hold some hope for things like actually seeing wild Pokemon moving through the environments, wandering in the grasses and through the mountains, swimming in the seas and lakes, climbing the trees, flittering through the air. Perhaps even we'll be able to use the sneaking mechanic or something like it from the Hoenn remakes Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire to engage in battles with these wandering wild Pokemon. The sneak mechanic from Auras is something I loved and has been sorely missing ever since. Man, I miss that Dexnef. Best version of that second screen experience ever, in my humble opinion. I also hope, if we do indeed revisit an environmentally modified Kanto, that we get to visit the prefecture next door and can have similar experiences in Johto as part of the main story, or in a second chapter, or in post-game stuff, whatever. I feel like for a Nintendo Switch game, the size of Kanto may feel a bit too small to make the new game truly feel significant on the Nintendo Switch. Hell, I'd even be okay if Johto was something that came along as paid DLC six months after launch to keep those engagement and sales numbers ticking for the number crunches at Nintendo. And Johto 2, of course, being literally on the other side of a mountain range, would also have been significantly altered by whatever environmental change Kanto had undergone. Mechanically in the game, I'm really hoping they don't try to tie in any motion control stuff, especially like throwing the Pokeball and such, as has been the subject of absolutely blind speculation from the community, based on nothing more than it has a similar name to Pokemon Go. I'd also like to see a free control camera so we can look around as we do in regular third-person view adventure games like Breath of the Wild. This could open up so many more opportunities for puzzle solving, for navigation through the world, finding those little paths and things like that, finding items hidden behind stuff you wouldn't normally see from a fixed camera angle, Pokemon hunting, of course, and frankly, just getting really cool-looking screenshots. <laughs> 
There's probably more I'm forgetting, but this has all been a kind of stream of consciousness thing. And these are discussions I've had, of course, with my community over on Twitch as I've been playing my Coin Lock Pokemon Ultra Moon playthrough. But yeah, long story shorter, I am hopeful for some cool new stuff as Pokemon is unshackled from its low power, low res history and is at last unleashed in HD on a much more powerful system. And we should all be careful not to get too attached to any particular rumor or fandom conjecture. And sure, I know, it's fun and interesting to speculate, but when talk of hopes and wishes turn into expectation, you're gonna have issues. It's always more fun to be pleasantly surprised than it is to go into something with highly specific expectations and to have them denied. I mean, hell, even if you go in with highly specific expectations and they're confirmed, you still don't get the joy of the surprise, the reveal. You just go, well, yeah, that's what I expected. Hooray. <laughs> so keep an open mind, please. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I will catch you next time.